Want to drive around like a maniac, but looking to come out alive if and when you crash? Don't have much money, but want some wheels that will still get you all the ladies? Well, you're in luck, because on today's menu, I'll be reviewing and ranking the second car I ever owned, the 1992 Mercury Cougar. I'm digging deep through my memory banks, not to mention my old VHS archives, to find out, was this the perfect car for my penniless, reckless teenage self? Let's find out. Welcome to the channel for anyone who wants to enjoy cars without breaking the bank. Today I'm thrilled to bring you part two of my used car ownership review series, where I'll be ranking all the 20 plus cars that I've ever owned and scoring them with the 10 category, 10 point practical car guy rating system. In episode one, I reviewed my very first car, this 1978 Chevrolet Caprice Classic. But right now, we're talking about the Mercury Cougar, if you're man enough. Cougar, it's the meanest, most masculine road animal yet. Cougar, if you're man enough. The Cougar roared to life in 1967 as a fancy pants version of the Ford Mustang. Over the decades, it morphed from a sports car aimed at men to more of a personal luxury car more aimed at women, eventually becoming a fancy pants version of the Ford Thunderbird. Move aside competition for the all new Cougar LS. This seventh generation of the T-Bird Cougar Twins debuted in 1989. Ford wanted this platform, dubbed MN12, to punch way above their price class, benchmarking yuppie luxury coupes like the BMW 6 Series. So Ford packed their coupes to the gills with tech, including an advanced independent rear suspension. Motor Trends Car of the Year Award. The automotive industry has always taken it seriously. And three of the last four years, Ford has taken it home. The coupes debuted to rave reviews and strong sales, but making a BMW at Ford sticker prices had a cost. Each MN12 came in 250 pounds over Ford's weight target. Worse still, each car would cost $900 more to make than anticipated, which meant one third of each car's profit would evaporate. Ford management was so peeved that they fired the leader of the MN12 project on the very night of Motor Trend's lavish Car of the Year ceremony. Damn Ford, that's cold-blooded. Ford's axing continued in 1997, where they killed the T-Bird and the Cougar due to declining sales, before axing the Mercury brand altogether in 2010. Press F to pay respects. Hey Cappy, how much is my fare going to be? I charge $5 a ride. Really? At my job, I get $50 a ride. So how did I end up adopting one of these cats after owning my Caprice? I loved my first car, but I wanted something newer, sportier, and less thirsty on gas. So after just a few years, I sold the Caprice to a retired couple and never saw it again. Man, this video is just making me sad. <laughs> to replace it, I ended up settling on this Cougar. Of the two MN12 twins, I would have preferred the Thunderbird as I was a big NASCAR fan. Yeah, Mark Martin! I just couldn't find a decent T-Bird in my small town for my meager budget. But I still had a blast with my Cougar. My friends and I ran around town filming these sort of terrible little videos together that we would air from the local public access station. Wait a minute, so here I am, 20 years later, making another video starring my Cougar that I'm beaming out to the world for free. I mean, what have I even done these past few decades? What have I even done with my life? Wrap yourself in a new Mercury Cougar. You'll find the attraction is purely physical. The first category I'll be scoring is looks. Let's just get straight to the Cougar's most polarizing element, that funky squared off rear window, which is the biggest difference between the Cougar and the T-Bird. And you know what? I dig the Cougar's look. It's unique, upright, and formal, totally fitting with Mercury's classier image. It's also a huge improvement over the Cougar that came before this generation. That older design had side glass that looked inverted and awkward by comparison. I wasn't a fan of the puckered mouth and cross-eyed look of the front end of my car, so I got these mm, questionable smoked headlight lens covers to help dress it up a bit. My car had the sharp saw blade style wheels, which I think were easily the best option you could get that year. And there are a few well-placed sheet metal creases that are subtle but effective all over the exterior. As for interior styling, eh, mostly a mishmash of hard angles. They smoothed out the interior in later model years, which had a rounder look that was a lot more cohesive. Overall, it's a handsome but unexciting design, so it gets a 6 out of 10. I mean, hey, I wasn't embarrassed to take it to prom. It wasn't a chick magnet, but at least the girls didn't run away screaming. 
Cougar's supercharger takes in 300 cubic feet of air per minute. So you'll just love taking in the scenery. Cougar. Drivetrain. These cars had a weird menu of engine options. The base Cougars like mine had the good old 3.8 liter V6 that was used in the Taurus family sedan and minivans, good for about 140 horsepower. This was the base engine for all the model years, easy peasy. But the up-level XR7 trims engines were all over the place, even though they were all good for around the same 200 horsepower. At first it had the supercharged version of the base V6. A few years later, that was swapped out for the Mustang's 5.0 liter V8. And then starting in 1994, the top engine option once again changed to the overhead cam 4.6 liter V8. All the engines were tuned for smoothness and low end torque, not high speed power. So even the top engines weren't exactly rocket ships. But right off the line, even my base V6 was reasonably peppy and I could get the rear wheels loose without too much effort. I just wish it sounded better than a Taurus. As for transmission options, five-speed manuals were only available in the supercharged models. But for all the other versions of these cars, they were all sold with four-speed automatics like mine that were, eh, fine. Overall, I score my car's drivetrain a three. The V6 and automatic did the job, but without any inspiration. Add one point for the optional engines, which did a lot better job at handling the weight of these fat cats. This cat could become man's best friend. <laughs> Reliability is mixed. Consumer Reports rates overall reliability worse than average, and Dashboard Light, which is a website that tracks only powertrain reliability, puts the Cougar way low, only two points out of 100. That unfortunately seems to line up with my own research, because V6 models like mine were notorious for head gasket issues, and the overdrive on the automatic transmissions commonly fail. Heater cores are also known to conk out, and those suckers are underneath the dash, so they're a royal pain to replace. But I have to weigh this data against my personal experience. And at least for the few years that I had mine, it ran flawlessly, which is insane because at age 17, I was absolutely brutal to this poor thing. I drove it over curbs and took it on so many jumps that the unibody started to creak, but mine ran like a train. If something does break, most parts are still cheap and easy to find, and there's decent online support to help you out. Four out of 10 for liability, bump it up a point if you get the V8. Look, just get the V8. Great style, airbags, you can add the V8. Ooh, wait, don't get the V8 if you care a lot about gas mileage, because it gets a few MPGs worse. I averaged around 17, but I was driving around like an absolute lunatic, and thankfully it only needed cheap, regular gas. Five out of 10 for mine, minus one point for the V8. Great, now I can practice my future career as a Hollywood stunt driver. Stunt driver? Yeah, watch this. Yeah! Ah, what do you think of that? That was pretty cool. I'd call the handling on these cars stable, but not thrilling. You feel every one of the 3,700 pounds, but the weight feels like it's down low, so at least it's steady and secure. For me, this is an ideal chassis for figuring out vehicle dynamics in the high school parking lot. It would never surprise you, and it was slow enough where you could react in time if it did. The steering was speed sensitive, so it firmed up the faster you went, but no matter what speed you were going, it was still numb and slow. The sportier upmarket versions of these cars had suspensions that could be firmer with the flick of a switch, and I really wish my car had that option. My car wasn't exactly a BMW in the twisties, but for a big American coupe, it handled its weight well enough to earn a four out of 10. Mercury Cougar, this car is you. These aren't sports cars, but they are as comfy as your favorite old pillow. <sighs> the ride is super smooth without being too floaty, and there's a ton of space inside, front or back. Even base model cars like mine had a ton of features. Everything was power operated, and mine had this optional digital dash with a trip computer. Pretty rad. One of the best features for a forgetful klutz like me was this keypad entry system. Even if you locked your keys inside, you could open the car with just a five digit code. Unfortunately, once inside, you were surrounded by chintzy plastic and yucky fake wood. The materials on the seats were nice though. Mine had the cloth inserts with the leather sides, a neat hybrid that I think is the best of both worlds. Why don't more cars have this? It's a shame the foam inside the seats was a bit too soft and unsupportive. Seven out of 10 for comfort, moving on. Aya! Good little girl. <laughs> this ought to kill him for sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Practicality. Day in and day out, these are pretty easy cars to live with. The trunk is big enough to fit a lawnmower, and an upside of the notchback is the trunk's opening is a lot bigger than the Thunderbirds. But from the inside, that tiny backlash and huge pillars created blind spots. The doors were huge and heavy. Getting in and out of a tight space could be a real challenge. I also have to ding the car for not having any cup holders. What's a personal luxury coupe without a place to put your personal luxury soda? Six out of 10, some flaws, but pretty practical for a coupe. By the way, if you've ever owned one of these Cougars or Thunderbirds, sound off in the comments below. I love hearing your thoughts and memories of these old cars. Now, onwards to safety. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot my keys in the car. Take care of my bags. <laughs> wait a minute, I hear something. Hmm? Sounds familiar. Wait a minute. Oh! Ah! Ah! No, no! These tanks did great in crash tests at the time, scoring four to five stars. However, early models like mine lacked some pretty important safety features, like airbags, which didn't arrive until 1994. Instead of airbags, earlier models were stuck with motorized shoulder belts. Yep, they'd motor forward when you open the door and then motor back over you when you closed it. You'd then buckle a separate lap belt and you're good to go. A lot of people hated these, but I liked them. You didn't have to reach backwards awkwardly to like strap yourself in, it's just done for you. Still, airbags are the safer option, so without them, this gets a five, while 1994 and later cars get an extra point. Don't worry, I'm keeping track of all these exceptions for the final score, I swear. Some people want it all. Money, power, good looks, and some people get it all in a Mercury Cougar. Specialness. The only weird or special thing about my car was that notchback styling. Otherwise, they sold a lot of these cars, and while it's getting tougher to find clean ones these days, they don't exactly stop traffic. The driving experience isn't all that special either, unless you get a supercharged model. For the purposes of this video, I'm not going to score the sporty supercharged versions as they're almost their own special cool thing. But for the regular versions of these cars, we're at 10 for specialness and on to the last category. Check out the new wraparound cockpit. Now check out the lowest sticker price in its class. Purchase price. This category rates how much an average good example goes for nowadays. And this is the Cougar's ace in the hole. Even when new, these were great deals. And now, after 20 years of depreciation, they represent an insane amount of car for the money. Nice supercharged models are easily the most valuable, and they top out in the 10K range. But if you just focus on the other versions of these cars, the standard V6 or the V8s, they can be had for like two to three grand. Even museum condition, low mileage MN12s struggle to bring more than 4K. Line that up with my purchase price scoring system, and these represent some of the cheapest cars you can buy right now, scoring a perfect 10. So why are these so cheap these days? Well, they're not that rare, and they only appeal to a narrow slice in the market. Demand is super low for big, gas-guzzling coupes that aren't very sporty. But if you can scrounge up some gas money and deal with the inconvenience of two doors and occasional repairs, a Cougar or a T-Bird is and was an amazing value. Nancy, Thunderbird really does offer tremendous value. You bet it does. Time to tally it all up and compare the scores. I'm gonna make two different totals. One is the official score from our actual car, which was an early V6 model that comes out to 53 out of 100. But let's say you've got a Cougar that was a 1994 or newer model, outfitted with a V8 and airbags. While you lose a point for fuel economy, you gain a point in drivetrain, reliability, and safety bring the total up to 56. That's a strong score. I've driven this version before, and it's the one I would personally recommend to most people. In any case, either of the two specs that I've rated handily beat out the score for my Caprice. But that shouldn't be surprising. The Caprice came out 12 years before the MN12 coupes, and those 12 years saw huge advancements in automotive design and engineering, busting out of the 70s malaise era of car design and rocketing forward into Radwood territory. And unlike the Caprice, you could still easily daily drive one of these coupes today. I only sold mine because I went off to college, where I didn't think I would need a car. But after just a single horrible year without wheels, I was so desperate to drive again, I had to pick up another piece of cheap American iron. Or was it European? We'll get into that in the future ownership review, so make sure to subscribe to see more videos coming soon. Until then, thanks for watching. See you next time.